let's initially discuss the natural history of arteriovenous malformations, at least what we understand to be the natural history. There is thought to be a risk of about 3% per year of, of uh, hemorrhage from an arterial venous malformation. This very much has been shown to be dependent upon AVM size, obviously uh, whether or not they present with, with hemorrhage versus, for instance, epilepsy, or, um, when they present in terms of childhood versus adulthood. Um, and certainly that risk of bleeding is increased if you've had a previous hemorrhage. There is, most studies will show, uh, about a 10% risk of severe morbidity or mortality associated with each hemorrhage from an arterial venous malformation, even in, in a contemporary era. There are different ways we talk about arterial venous malformations, and I uh, um, have a colleague here from the Barrow Neurological Institute, Dr. Spetzler, has developed what, uh, what is the most widespread grading system for arterial venous malformations shown here. Bas basically, it breaks down into three different categories, size of the AVM, in this case, a linear dimension of the AVM, eloquent or non-eloquent cortex, and superficial or deep draining drainage from the AVM. And sometimes you can have both, of course, but if it were deep, it would fall into the, if there were a deep component, you'd, you would um, uh, get a one point in this category. Obviously, the, the greater the number of this category, the greater the risk, but that risk is, is associated with resection. There are at least two other grading systems are out there. We've proposed one, and um, uh, University of Pittsburgh, where Bruce Pollock and John Flickinger were, uh, developed this, this grading system. Basically, they are in many ways similar. This involves an equation factoring in volume, age, and location. Ours factors in volume history of previous hemorrhage, which we found to be more important, and eloquent location. If you will, you'll see, though, that there are a number of different, different um, factors that are all sort of uh, uh, permeating these three different grading systems. These grading systems shown on this slide are really, are, are really validated for radius surgical outcomes, not for microsurgical outcomes. So what are the goals with the management of, our, of of AVMs. The goals are, are really elimination of the hemorrhagic risk in the future, obviously to preserve neurological function whenever possible, and then to minimize the treatment-related risks associated with, with dealing with this AVM. And there are, in, in the modern era, uh, at least three viable treatment approaches for many of these patients, microsurgery, radiosurgery, and endovascular. And, and these are not mutually exclusive, as you can, uh, as depicted here by this Venn diagram. Certainly, uh, embolization is having an increasing role in the management of patients with AVMs. Surgical resection has been a mainstay of treatment. Radiosurgery, there have been more than 80,000 AVM patients treated with radiosurgery alone. And then conservative management for those who have, uh, have had an AVM picked up incidentally or who, or who may have uh, epilepsy associated it with their AVM but no prior hemorrhage. Sometimes we'll simply follow these patients because either the risk is too great or of, of treating them or the, or, or the perceived benefit is too little. For radiosurgery, I, I think that the role of radiosurgery is, is, is most valuable in managing AVMs that are small and deep-seated. Uh, certainly those that are small and accessible could go either the route of resection or, or radiosurgery. Those that are larger and deep-seated are, are reasonably well-suited for radiosurgery. Those that are larger and accessible are probably going to be either managed with, through a combination of embolization and resection. Just in brief, the radiosurgical technique for AVMs is a little bit different than it is for acoustic neuromas or brain metastasis or skull-based tumors. Uh, this is, in, in general, what, what's done in my institution with a little bit of mild sedation, placement of some kind of a frame. Uh, certainly one could use a frameless um, um, device like a, a, <clears throat> a mask where, where uh, penetration and, and rigid fixation may not be required. We still do biplanar angiography on all of our AVM cases. We do couple it with MR and MRA. Uh, or one can do CT, CTA. 
And then there's the, the dose planning phase uh, and then the radiation delivery. With these patients who do have a history of, of seizures, we're, we're careful to check their anticonvulsant level and to make sure that they're therapeutic before the procedure. And we usually give a single dose of steroids around the time of radiosurgery. The AVM uh, cases are, are the, the single case with any regularity that will use angiographic guidance. And, and it is a little different than, it, than typical tomographic guidance. You can appreciate that, that using biplanar an, angi, an, angiography here, you can see a lateral projection, AP projection. One can't exclusively target off this, but I do think particularly for small AVMs uh, that, that angiographic guidance is, is critical. For the larger AVMs, it may not be quite as critical. I do think that angiographic confirmation of obliteration remains the gold standard. Uh, Dr. Friedman published a, a paper just a short while ago. We have one working its way through that, that uh, continues to confirm that even with using fairly sophisticated MR, MRI, MRA, or CT, CTA, that some AVMs that appear obliterated uh, um, uh, may in fact not be, and, and that it's worth following these patients up with angiographic confirmation of obliteration over time. Just in, in thinking about radiosurgical dose planning, uh, there, if one looks at an, and has an AVM like this, which we targeted, you, uh, certainly one wants to consider the volume of the AVM, the location, critical structures that may be uh, near there, prior hemorrhage. I'm a bit more aggressive with my dose selection and for that matter recommending radiosurgery if someone's had a previous hemorrhage versus someone who may not have had one but may have, have um, other associated symptoms. Whether or not they've had em any embolic material that may obscure the, the view of the ninus, uh, that can be difficult, especially with onyx. Whether or not there's an area of encephalomalacia that may be close by. For instance, if there is, um, one might dump dose, and it's a, a bit of a crude term, but be less conformal near an area of encephalomalacia and more conformal near an area that, that uh, um, doesn't have, have changes that may be associated with a prior hemorrhage or stroke. And certainly then the conformality, the gradient index, and then um, I don't think we've heard quite about this before, but this in the two previous talks, but the, this V12 um, is, is something that we look at pretty extensively with our AVMs and do look at for some other cases as well, and that's been shown to be uh, relevant in terms of predicting complications associated with, with radiosurgery for AVMs. So in outcomes for radiosurgery with AVMs, we're really looking first and foremost at obliteration rates. And by obliteration, I mean that the AVM is, is, is occluded on, on, on post-radiosurgical angiographic testing. Certainly MRI, MRA can be used to confirm obliteration, but, it, but there may be a, a, um, a, a false negative test with MRI, MRA. And then we certainly look at, at other secondary outcomes in terms of sim symptomatic control in terms of seizures uh, in patients who've had previous epilepsy associated with their AVMs headaches and other neurological deficits, for instance, vascular steel that may occur with, with an AVM. It's been pretty well documented, and, and as a footnote in history, the, um, my predecessor at UVA treated and published what I believe to be the first successful radiosurgical case of an AVM that was obliterated. And, and hearing him tell the story about how he arrived at the dose, first, you know, I showed you pictures before where we cover the entire AVM, nidus, with, with the prescription isodose line, he found what he determined to be the fistulous communication between, um, in the nidus, and just targeted a single spot in, in a large AVM. And then he looked at some of the radiation therapy literature and found that, that some had had success using fractionary radiation therapy delivering 50 gray, and, and being uh, not wanting to do any harm, in a procedure that hadn't been validated, he said, well, let's half the dose. And, and through uh, e either, I tend to think, through, um, um, through in incredible intelligence, but maybe he played it off as serendipity, that that, that half the dose, the 50, uh, uh, 50 to 25 reduction, that the 25 gray seemed to be the optimal dose to, to and, and has been borne out to be a fairly optimal dose in terms of achieving obliteration, as is depicted here. So against plotting dose versus obliteration rate. 
So you can see that it plateaus at about 25 gray, uh, that you don't get much more bang for your buck by going above, and you actually do get substantially greater complication rate. And, and that most AVMs are treated with a dose of somewhere between 16 to 18 gray up to 25 gray to the prescription or the edge of the, of the nidus. And you can see what's, what uh, in these histological studies in an animal model that were done at the University of Virginia, uh, how there's intimal hyperproliferation and that these AVMs gradually go on to occlude. It's, it's clear that unlike um, the argument that may be brewing with acoustic aromas and other things, that fractionation really doesn't give great um, value in these cases. Actually, it probably works against you, um, and substantially so, in terms of achieving obliteration, with the exception of, of AVMs that may be too large to treat in a single session. So what are the... Um, what are the types of outcomes one might see? Well, this is one, um, uh, certainly partial obliteration. When one takes an AVM that looks like this prior to radiosurgery and, and at three years out, which is when the obliteration is usually assessed, that one sees a smaller nidus, but it's not all gone. Uh, so this has been pretty well described to not reduce the risk of hemorrhage. So that hemorrhage risk still hovers around 2 to 3 or maybe 4%. Maybe a slight reduction, but not much. But it does certainly uh, give some benefits for those who have had seizures. Uh, you don't have to have obliteration to achieve improvements in, in, in epilepsy associated with an AVM. So there are some benefits, but we would treat this patient again. Treatment may be repeat radiosurgery. For the, for the remaining nidus, it may be resection or embolization, but this patient probably warrants additional treatment. Subtotal obliteration um, is something that is a bit confusing. Um, it is, in fact, absence of the AVM nidus, but persistence of a draining vein. And we saw this in about 10% um, of patients that we treated with radiosurgery at UVA and have published a few experiences. So the, the, um, the Stockholm group, Christopher Lindquist and others have published about this. But in essence, you take a, a complex AVM shown here, and then what you're left with is no, no discernible nidus, which, which is marvelous in, in something like this, which one wouldn't be able to easily resect, much less embolize and cure. But you see, a, you see an early draining vein here. On, and we found pretty convincingly that this is, is um, likely a safe and good result, that we have not seen uh, uh, any incidences of, of hemorrhage, and we just tend to follow these patients. Um, and, and in fact, many of the times with another angiogram in a year that this, that this early draining vein disappears. So it's likely um, a, a stage on the, on the obliteration spectrum, and, and it's probably not worth retreating. And then, of course, what we would hope to see is, is an instance like this where, where one takes a, a very surgically difficult to access AVM from the posterior circulation of Basler and, uh, and in fact uh, achieve a complete angiographically confirmed obliteration at about three years out. When we looked at a series of, of greater than 1,000 AVMs that were treated and helped to derive that, that scoring system that I had shown you earlier, we're, we're hovering at about 75 to 80 percent long-term obliteration, not at three years, but usually about four or five. 10% that had subtotal obliteration, 5% that had some degree of partial obliteration, 5% that had no angiographic change at three, year, three years out. So these patients that have no angiographic change or that have a partial obliteration really weren't repeat treatment. But you can see that we're having some substantial benefits in terms of risk reduction in terms of future hemorrhage in 90% or more patients long term with, with radiosurgery. This very much depends upon the volume. Uh, the smaller the, the AVM volume at the time of initial radiosurgery, the more likely we'll achieve obliteration so that a, 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 a 3cc or smaller AVM nidus has a, a, a very high chance of success, whereas when one gets above that, um, our success rate was about 60 percent. Again, optimal prescription dose is about 18 to 25 gray. Going above that doesn't seem to give much benefit and actually increases complications pretty substantially. We have a couple papers working their way through, but this was from a, 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 a that look at this in greater detail with the help of Mark Quigg, one of our epileptologists at UVA. But this was from a previous work. We're seeing about 77% that, that had uh, seizure control after 
after AVM radio surgery. And in fact, very few have an increase in risk of seizures. Typically, if that does happen, it's a transient risk and oftentimes associated with adverse radiation effect in the surrounding brain parenchyma. The, um, there are complications with radio surgery. We're throwing around a pretty high dose, uh, oftentimes more than we would give to uh, uh, most lesions with the exception of brain metastasis. And we, we see about a 6 to 9% risk in, throughout the literature of adverse radiation changes and about a 1 through 3%, depending upon the location, risk of permanent adverse radiation effects. This again depends, this is some work from John Flickinger in the Pittsburgh group, it, it depends upon location, deeper seated uh, AVMs are more risk prone and more superficially located ones in the parietal region, for instance, are, are far less risk prone. Uh, um, complications are more associated with larger volumes, previous embolization, uh, those that had no previous hemorrhage and those that had, had um, AVMs situated in, in eloquent locations. When you see something like this, though, and this is, a, this is obviously a very um, uh, challenging case to deal with in the sense that you've got a nice compact nidus, you've treated it, you thought it was going to have a marvelous result, it's a small volume, um, patient, the patient had had a previous hemorrhage, you can see the pronounced T2-weighted signal changes around this. You, you first turn to steroids, you may turn to vitamin E and Trentol, there's some literature to support that, so occasionally you use hyperbaric oxygen. We've had, on a few instances, used um, Avastin to try to reduce this, uh, and certainly I would, if the patient were not on anticonvulsants, I would have put them on them as I try to ride the patient through this situation. Every once in a while, you're forced to resect. So I, I'm going to spend the rest of, or the better part of the rest of this talk just mentioning uh, a trial that's, that's come um, even to the, into the lay press and, and probably affects what we're going to do more than anything that I've shown you um, just before about management of, of patients with unruptured AVMs. This trial and another one uh, that was done in, in Scotland are, uh, have both been published in the last year. This was a uh, trial that was intended to accrue 400 patients, it and they were intended to be followed for five to 10 years. It was randomized between medical treatment and surgery. And the, by surgery, they talk about embolization, radiosurgery, or uh, resection. The trial was halted, this Aruba trial, uh, with a mean fall of 33 months. Just about half the, the participants that they had intended to enroll uh, were actually enrolled and they, uh, they were originating from 39 sites. And what they found was that the Data Safety Monitoring Board stopped the trial because there was a great, threefold greater risk of, of adverse events in the treatment arm than the medical management, conservative management arm. So this is going to continue to be followed, but um, you can appreciate here, again, a, a, um, uh, the fact that lower risk in the medical treatment, but a very short follow-up. If I've just told you that radiosurgery doesn't usually achieve success for at least three years, uh, most of these patients um, are, aren't even at that three-year time point. And in fact, the standard deviation of the follow-up was 19.7 months. There are some issues with this. There have been a number of, art of letters that have come out um, um, criticizing this, but this is, in fact, the highest level of evidence we have right now about management of unruptured AVMs. But the, some of the issues that have arisen are issues with equipoise. Um, a high rate, uh, a high percentage of these patients who were, were random or, or who were placed into the, the intervention arm were treated with embolization alone, which for most neurosurgeons is usually not a standalone treatment, um, except for very small AVMs, but is usually a treatment that's done uh, in advance of a resection. And there have been some issues with the short follow-up and then uh, to an extended degree of clinical proficiency, particularly with the high rate of complications associated with the, with the embolization arm in this, in this study. They're going to continue to be followed out, but there's, this has is, uh, this is really um, caused a, a good bit of controversy within how we should manage these patients because, in part, we thought we understood what, what these patients' risks were and that we thought that they were high. So here are a number of the studies that are out there that looked at the natural history of, of, of ABMs. And the, um, the broken lines are those that, uh, from the series that have no previous hemorrhage. The solid lines are those that, that from the same series that have had previous hemorrhage and their likelihood of develop, developing a second hemorrhage. And you can see that within a five to ten year period of time, 
that the, the natural history studies suggest that there's at least a 15, if not a 29 or, or greater percent risk of repeat hemorrhage within 5 to 20 years. Unfortunately, with the mean fall in the Aruba trial of only 33 months, we're not going to see most of those patients have a hemorrhage yet. But I do think over time we might actually see some, uh, some beginnings of complications in the management arm that we haven't seen given this natural history data, but we'll have to wait and see. Maybe, in fact, the pendulum will swing towards a bit more aggressive intervention. What we um, did when we, uh, in advance of this study, and this has been published, was to really look at our cohort of 440 patients who had unruptured AVMs that were treated with radiosurgery alone. And we found, a, a, not surprisingly, a, a pretty high rate of obliteration. Again, if one looks out to, uh, you know, about, about um, uh, four and a half to five years, about a 60% rate of obliteration, all comers of, of more than 400 patients. So that's twice the Aruba, uh, Aruba power. And when we looked at, at in the latency period leading up to obliteration, the risk in this group of unruptured, previously unruptured AVMs was 1.6% um, across the, the entire patient population. Symptomatically, um, uh, Again, we saw patients largely improve with regard to presenting symptoms, which are oftentimes seizures. We, we did see seizure improvement in, in nearly 52% of patients. New onset seizures associated with radiosurgery in less than 1% of this series of 444 patients. So in, in large part, a pretty successful outcome, symptomatic improvement in the vast majority. Now, granted, this was a retrospective study, not a prospective one, and there's selection bias. Obviously, it was a, uh, one that, that we seem to think, though, that treating select cases with unruptured AVMs may be warranted, despite the Aruba trial data. So let me just touch upon large AVMs, and, and there are different techniques. I mentioned earlier that I think that fractionation for AVM radiosurgery is counterproductive and the literature would support that in large part, with the exception of large AVMs, where there are different approaches that can be taken. So when one t considers a Spetzer Martin grade 4 or 5 AVM, uh, which would be very challenging to resect, but where there's been a previous hemorrhage, and considering, the, um, uh, considering partially embolizing it, especially high-risk features, such as a perinatal aneurysm, and then you can do different things. There are two different approaches, volume staging it, breaking the nidus up into, into maybe half or thirds. So as you've seen here, we've, we've taken this large AVM and treated the upper portion and then the lower portion second. Actually, I think we did it the opposite, treating the deeper portion first and the superficial part second. Or you can, or uh, uh, Tony and his group have, have, um, have uh, done this and, and not volume stage it, but dose staged it. So treating, treating this with a, with a, with a uh, treating the entire nidus with a lower dose and then going back and, and giving a similar dose a second time. There's certainly advantages and disadvantages to both. I, I tend to gravitate towards a volume staged approach, but I see merits to both. And, and that um, we know that the obliteration rates are not going to be as great that 80% long term obliteration rate. But it's probably on, on the order of 50% or lower, but partial obliteration for these patients can, be substan can lead to substantial improvements, especially I've had some patients who had substantial vascular steel. I had a, a, a guy who worked in the Harley-Davidson uh, bike factory, and, and, and by partially obliterating his AVM, he was able to get back to doing the kind of manual work, uh, fine manual work that he wanted to do with his job. Repeat radiosurgery is sometimes done in these cases, again, where there's partial obliteration. What, where we found that going back a second time is, it, it confers very low risk. Uh, and in fact, that the risk seems to be just about on par with an initial risk if one waits at least three years to retreat the patients. There are a number of, of other radiosurgical series out there by a uh, number of uh, members in the audience here, uh, Dr. Friedman and uh, included, that, that show that these results all uh, hover around uh, reasonable success rates of at least 50 to 8, sometimes as high as 90 percent obliteration rates, again, depending upon the patient cohorts. I do think that embolization has a role. Uh, uh, preoperative embolization, however, likely reduces the long-term rate of obliteration if one controls for, for the volume uh, of either pre- or post-embolization volume. 
This may have to do with some degree of obscuring of, of the targeting at the time of radiosurgery or even some recandalization through the embolized nidus. And certainly, though, we do embolize pa patients' AVMs when they're too large to treat with single-session radiosurgery or where there may be high-risk features. And this work uh, uh, that I believe came out of the Toronto group shows pretty nicely a difference in the ob obliteration rates between the, the previously embolized AVMs and the non-embolized AVMs. And then um, one final example uh, in terms of, uh, of getting out of, of, of jail free, we, we, we've gotten a couple of, of instances of, of T2-weighted signal changes that have been pretty pronounced. I touched upon this before. And we've gone to using, and, and, and Dr. Sue mentioned this earlier, uh, uh, yesterday, about the use of Avastin. And we've, we've gotten ourselves out of trouble with the use of Avastin. In some instances, pretty pronounced perinatal edema around an, an AVM that, that uh, was proceeding to obliteration and a nice response even two weeks out after. And thus far, we haven't had a hemorrhage associated with the, the administration of Avastin in the few instances we've used it, either in the setting of AVMs or tumors. So just in conclusion, I'll say that in large part, I think, AVM radiosurgery, harkening back to Dr. Steiner's successful treatment in 1971, uh, has changed the way we manage patients. It, it has a consistent long-term improvement in patients with AVMs. Certainly, MR and angiographic planning is, is necessary. Careful dose selection for all the factors I've mentioned are important. Multiple procedures are sometimes required for large AVMs, and that we can really make a substantial difference in their, their natural history. Certainly, those that have had previous hemorrhage, and even I would submit to you those that haven't had previous hemorrhage associated with their AVMs. Embolization should be reserved for those cases where the AVM nodus is too large to treat or where there may be high risk features. I think it's a treatment of choice in 2014 for Spetzer Martin grade 3 AVMs. Uh, certainly not everyone will agree, but um, uh, in large part I think it, the literature supports this pretty nicely. It's a reasonable treatment option for grade 4 Spetzer Martin AVMs, and I think it competes nicely for grade 1 and 2 AVMs and, and um, has some value for even Spetzer Martin grade 5 AVMs. And for asymptomatic lesions, we really have to weigh the natural history. Uh, the RUBA trial and others uh, and payers will make us think about this. But I, I do think that over time, and as the RUBA trial patients are followed longer term, that there will be, in fact, more events in the medical treatment arm than in the, tr in the actual uh, surgically or, or radiosurgically treated arm. Time will tell. Thank you.